All right. So um, we'll begin. We'll continue to learn uh, optimization. Um, here, here is a is a big picture. So we have learned how to find the minimum or minimize of a function back in calculus, back in Cal three. Okay. So. Uh, First is a review. Um, um, this is this is uh, this is our goal, which is to minimize. Okay, let me check uh, for the review student if uh, it's if it's good enough for the resolution. So this this is uh, what we, we would like to uh, achieve. And uh, um, so last time, last time uh, we learned what conditions a local minimum, um, a local minimizer must satisfy. Local minimizer means points, and the local minimum means the value of uh, we plug in. in is point to the function. Um, so to speak uh, like what function value we obtain. And in calculus uh, three, uh, we are told to do the following, okay? We are told to do the following, which is we solve. So we, we evaluate the gradient, we evaluate the gradient basically is uh, every partial derivative. We evaluate the gradient, we let this guy to be zero and we solve for uh, a point, a critical point, okay? Solve for um, this point. And we may have several critical uh, points, but that's okay. And then we move on to check the Hessian We move on to check the Hessian and we must have, so if the Hessian is the following, then we must have, we must have A11 is greater than zero, A22 is greater than zero, and uh, um, we must have, so, in order that a minimum is achieved, so in order that By a minimizer, we mean local minimizer. Um, and uh, um, and the Hessian at this point, which is, let me use a new panel. It must satisfy a11 is greater than zero, A22 is greater than zero. And we have um, the product of this subtract of this square is greater than zero. All right. um, what we mean here is um, because they, uh, in the off diagonal, they are equal. So this is partial xx, this is partial yy, this is partial xy, this is a, a partial uh, yx. Okay, so let me just start. use this notation. Say ij, so this is two first. Okay, something like that. And this is, this is what we have learned. 
this is uh, we like uh, um, um, we illustrate what is it like to uh, minimize a quadratic form. So we uh, we make use of uh, the quadratic form. We illustrate uh, what is it like to uh, to minimize the quadratic form. So in the way that illustrate why we want to evaluate Hessian uh, back in calculus three. So today we're going to prove why we need to set this to be zero. Okay. So. In calculus, we've learned that the, if the derivative is zero, we may get a local minimum or maximum there, but we never prove. If you, do, if you didn't take an honor calculus, uh, we may uh, not have a proof, like a rigorous proof of why we wanna let the derivative to be zero. So let's recall local minimum of local minimizer. Um, so we copied down the rigorous definition of local minimizer last time. Uh, today, I'm just gonna give us a heuristic definition um, on the local minimizer. The local minimizer is as follow. So uh, we say uh, X star is a local minimizer if there exists a neighborhood of X star such that in this neighborhood, the function value at X star is the smallest. It's like a it's literally saying x star at x star, the function value is less than uh, the function value achieved at the neighbors. So uh, such that exist a neighborhood of x star such that in this neighborhood, in this neighborhood, neighborhood, let's do this little omega right here. Okay, so such that in this omega, So it's like uh, in the neighborhood, the function value is the smallest. And uh, um, then we say this is a local minimizer. And last time we also, we also, um, we also learned the theorem. So we present the theorem, but we haven't proved it yet. So today we'll prove it. Um, the theorem says the following, the theorem says the following, if X star is a local minimizer, okay, for every feasible direction, D, such that um, the gradient dot product with this D is greater than zero. Okay. The interpretation, first, um, again, um, I, I think I briefly said about the interpretation of this theorem last time. It's thinking about, so for example, I'm actually at the local minimum of the classroom, All right. if we talk about the altitude. It means this one, okay? This one means no matter what direction I'm walking toward, my altitude will be non-decreasing. Non okay, for example, if I walk here, my altitude will increase. And uh, so 
let me start over here and I walk toward, for example, this way, my altitude will increase. And this condition is literally saying that is, this is saying the rate of change along any direction at this point will be non-negative. So, um, and uh, to prove this, let's review, uh, let's review some Cal 3. Uh, stuff is a directional derivative. Okay. The directional derivative um, along direction D. By the way, we have to restrict, um, so uh, two norm of D is one. I say the two norm is just the length of a vector. Okay. Um, the directional derivative along D is defined at, is defined as the gradient F evaluate at a point uh, dot product with this direction. So this is a definition of directional derivative and uh, um, notation wise, notation wise, you may see some of uh, some of people writing this way, which is uh, uh, capital, it's a capital D, little d means direction and then of f evaluated at x equals x zero. Or you may see this notation partial f partial D, okay? So um, these are, these all mean the directional derivative. It means the rate of change in that direction. Okay, now let's see why this is uh, the rate of change along that direction, which we'll use an important tool we're gonna use to prove this theorem. So this is panel number four, and this is panel number five. Um, we define the following function. The function is as follows. We define, uh, we define g of t, we define g of t as the following. So we're sitting, We're sitting at uh, um, this x star, but we add a little perturbation of t, all right? So this t is, this t is a small positive number. Okay, so this t is maybe say, uh, is in zero epsilon. Zero, uh, can, zero can be achieved. So this T is between zero and epsilon so that um, this point right here, all right? So this point right here is still in the neighborhood we were talking about earlier. When we talk about local minimizer, it's, it's the lowest point. It's the lowest point. For example, I'm standing right here. This is a, actually here, sorry. Actually here, this is the lowest point of this classroom, but this is not the lowest point of the campus. All right, so it's a local minimum of this classroom. It's the same, same thing talking uh, about uh, um, this still needs to be within that neighborhood we were talking about, okay? So we choose T kind of small and we define a function like this and let's see what happens if we take the derivative of this function and then we evaluate 
the derivative at t equals zero. Okay. Think about this. This is adding a little perturbation in the direction of b. So if this is our this is our um, this is our x star, and our d is that direction, then this is like a moving this x star toward this direction a little bit. So we move this point right here. So we move this point along that direction a, a tiny bit. And we get to a new point, but it's still within uh, that, uh, it's still within the neighborhood omega so that this point is the smallest. And now we take derivative of this function at evaluate at zero. And by definition, by definition, it's as follows. Calculus one, okay. Definition of derivative. We define a function G and if f is smooth, and we all talk about a smooth f here because we can take the second derivative. Definition of the derivative and let's evaluate the derivative. Okay. If we evaluate the derivative, what happens is this is the same thing as g of t is just uh, um, it's just that. And g of zero is just uh, is just a f, f's value at the local minimizer. If we think about this, so we take a small increment, okay? And then we divide t, keep this in mind, keep this in mind. We have this, uh, um, we, we have uh, this d is one, so we have to restrict this d is one. Think about this. If this d is one, this is actually, this is actually this, all right. It's the same because uh, the, the, uh, the length of d is what? What is this? This is we measure. So we evaluate this function at this new point. We subtract the old function value at that point. Then we divide the length of this increment. It becomes rate of change along that direction when we take the limit, okay. And this is also the directional derivative. So if we compute this directly, by chain rule, if we compute this guy directly by chain rule, we'll get uh, essentially it's gradient F evaluated at X equals X star plus TD, uh, but uh, T is zero, okay. Dot product uh, DDT, so this is chain rule X star plus td. The first, first time we compute this function by definition, we get here. I mean, this, this expression has a very clear, has a very clear interpretation. It's because the numerator is the difference between two function value and the denominator is exactly the length of uh, where we move our point. Okay, so it's a rate of change along this direction. It's very clear. And then this is how we compute the directional derivative actually use, it's using chain rule. So if we evaluate this, 
this is x evaluated at this point, but t is zero, so it's at this point. So it's literally gradient of f evaluated at this point. And then we dot product, we take derivative of this vector function, we'll just get, uh, so we take derivative of t with respect to t, we'll just get this direction b. So this is dot product of b. And this is our directional derivative formula. I mean, we can, we can always, if d direction is not unit vector, we can always divide d by its length. So we get a unit vector. So that, that, that's, a, that's a bit technicality here. But overall, this is our directional derivative. It measures the rate of change along the d direction. So that's a physical interpretation. Now let's prove um, the theorem right here. So this is, uh, this is panel number six. Okay. Uh, now let's prove this theorem right here. Okay. So let's use panel. And we're one step closer to interpret why calculus asks us to evaluate like where the gradient is zero, but let's first prove here, okay? And um, the proof is actually um, kind of straightforward, okay? So um, we just define the G, we, we just define over there. We still have to restrict so that this t is small for a small t, for t small, uh, so that this point right here is still within our neighborhood, like uh, um, of within the neighborhood, so that x star is the smallest point. And now what happens is. Uh, um, We want to use actually um, Taylor uh, series. Okay. Let's see what happens here. What happens if we uh, if we expand the Taylor series of G of T because F is smooth, so G is smooth. There is no like singularity or jump here. So if we expand the Taylor series with respect to uh, zero, what we'll have is uh, um, so we have g of zero plus g prime of zero times t plus g double prime of let's say c okay divided by two t squared. So this is a this is a type uh, this is a Taylor. Taylor's series and uh, um, the second derivative term, the second derivative term, because, because, uh, uh, because F is smooth, so the double derivative is bounded. And what we can write is, uh, um, we can write this thing as a big O of T squared. It means it's a constant, it's a bounded constant times t squared, okay. And t squared is a, because t is small. So t squared is a much, much smaller term comparing with, oops, sorry, this is t not square, okay, linear term. So t squared is a much, much smaller term comparing with this term. And let's see what happens. So this is panel number six, this is panel number seven, and let, let's use this panel number eight.
So if we consider this difference, all right, this, this is G of T, by the way. This difference must be non-negative. Okay, so. So that thing right there must be non-negative because uh, um, XI is our local minimizer. So if we move anywhere else, we'll get a, a bigger function value. Now, let's look at here. The first term is G of T and this is G of zero. This term is g of zero. g of t subtract the g of zero is, uh, is exactly the linear term in the Taylor series plus a quadratic term in the um, Taylor series. So it equals g prime of zero times t plus um, big O t squared. Now here comes the tricky part. Okay, so t, first of all, t is a, t is a, um, we choose t to be uh, non-negative. So um, here is non-negative. And uh, um, So this implies, because the left-hand side is greater than zero, um, it implies this times t plus this constant times t squared is greater than zero as well. And we have derived what is this. This is right there. Okay. So what we have is gradient f evaluate at evaluated at the local minimizer, we, we derived over there, dot product with T times T plus, so big O T square. Um, we can think like, uh, we can think like this is a C T square with a C is some uh, constant, okay. So this is a big O T square This thing is uh, greater than or equal to zero. This is panel number nine. So the sum is greater than zero, and we know that t is non-negative, and we're going to conclude we're going to conclude that this thing right here is uh, non-negative. Okay, so we will assume otherwise. So now we assume we just we just use a quick proof uh, by contradiction. So we assume. If this number is negative, okay, um, because because uh, uh, because this term because this term is much much smaller in terms of magnitude than this term, then we can just choose. So if this thing is negative, so we can choose we can choose t small enough such that, so
okay. But not a zero. We choose t small enough, but t is not zero. Okay. We choose t small enough, but we choose t not to be zero, such that this is le less than zero. Okay. Let me explain why. Because we assume this is less than zero, and we assume t is not zero. It means this is a negative term. All right. However. This term is much, much smaller in magnitude when t is small than this term. And we can definitely choose a t so that this is less than zero and we get a contradiction because that is greater than or equal to zero, which means our assumption is wrong. And this implies which implies this thing must be greater than or equal to zero. It means we look at every direction, this function is increasing. So we look at every direction from the local minimizer, this function is increasing. And now we prove why in the calculus we are asked to solve for x, we let gradient to be zero. So then the corollary the corollary is um, at x star, which x star is our local minimizer, gradient of Uh, gradient of f evaluated at x star is a zero vector. With the help of the theorem earlier, we proved earlier this is a one line proof. Okay. So, why in the calculus we want to evaluate the function um, that a uh, um, gradient is zero? Why want to do that? It's a one line proof. So we assume otherwise. Okay. So we assume it's not zero. It's a, it's a typical like proof by contradiction. Okay. So we assume otherwise. So we assume this guy is not zero. So we denote the p vector is the gradient. I'm sorry, this should be not zero vector. Let me check if the remote student can see the edge of the board. Okay, they should be able to. It's a little bit dim. Let me adjust the contrast a little bit. Okay. Yeah, because here, so uh, let, me, let me rewrite. So the p vector is essentially the gradient of f evaluated at the local minimizer, and we assume it's not zero. Okay, so if it's not zero, what happens is we let we let d equals t times minus t times gradient of F evaluated at this point. T is greater than zero. And T is, again, T is some number that's small but positive. So that we don't, wor we don't have to worry about this function. Uh, the point goes out of the small neighborhood we are talking about throughout uh, today's class. What happens? P dot product with D. So this dot product with this, we get this is negative. We get this is negative 
the magnitude of F evaluated at evaluated at uh, uh, this minimum. Okay. So we assume our gradient is not zero. Then we choose a direction and we find that this is a gradient dot product with this direction is a negative number. <laughs> this is negative. This is not zero. So it's magnitude is not zero and T is positive. So this thing is negative and we get a, a contradiction. Okay, now we're done. So, uh, so we're good. This is panel number, this is panel number 10. And we're good, we're done. So we get a contradiction here. Okay, so we get a contradiction, which means our assumption is wrong. And uh, um, the gradient must be zero vector. Okay, so let me do a quick poll for the remote student. Um, I'm sure uh, if you are coming to the classroom, so I trust you already understand this. Um, okay. Um, but this is essentially the idea. The idea is at the local minimum, we look at every possible direction this function is increasing. So, um, and then the gradient is zero is a simple corollary of this observation. Okay, it's because we just uh, you prove by contradiction. And now let's, I don't know if I leave this open or close. Anyway. Um, okay, that's panel number 10. Let me use panel number nine. So next thing, next thing uh, we want to learn from calculus, or say we want to prove from calculus, is why. Um, so, so given f is smooth, and this is the lemma. So gradient f is at x equals x equals zero is the direction of f of x increases fastest at x zero. So this is another uh, thing we'll say a statement we have learned from calculus three without a proof, but some of you guys here may already seen a proof. Um, so, okay, so the Romeo student uh, says it's okay. So uh, we'll move on to prove this. In calculus, we have learned gradient of F is, a f I mean, the, the direction of the function increases faster than Y. Now let's, uh, Let's do a proof. Okay. So we consider, we consider, we uh, consider a feasible direction D. So it means we add some of uh, the multiple of this direction, we're still within the domain of the function. So we consider D such that uh, the length of D is one, but uh, well, let me just put a square there because uh, in the proof, it's much simpler if we opt for this uh, square. So consider a direction D such that it's a unit vector and the length of D is one, the length square is nothing but a D dot product with D itself. So we consider a direction, okay? And this direction can point left can point the right can point you know every possible direction from this point x zero and as long as it's a lens one we are in business so
and let's consider the directional derivative. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to maximize the directional derivative at x zero. So we want to maximize. So we want to maximize. This is uh, the gradient dot product with d. So this is the rate of change uh, along direction d. Okay. We're talking about rate of change, right? We want to maximize this because uh, um, we want to get the direction such that it increases fastest. So we want to maximize this rate of change. And, but we have a subject is we have to subject to two, the length of D is, uh, is one. So this is a constraint that is D dot product um, with D itself is, uh, uh, is, is zero. And this is a, this is a optimization. This is an optimization problem we would like to solve to get the direction this function increases fastest. And now let's solve it using Lagrange multiplier. So we define a new uh, function as follows. So we'll maximize this subject to, to that. So we find the critical point of, uh, of uh, this thing. Okay, so it's, sorry, it's not X anymore because D is now our variable. Uh, this is a fixed vector P. Okay. So, um, so we let we let gradient of F evaluate at this point is our vector P. So this vector is a fixed vector at this point, and we we want to maximize this number by choosing a D. So. So our variable is actually D and this is D and Lambda equals P time dot product with D plus Lambda D dot product with D subtract one. Okay. So this is a, this is a Lagrange multiplier problem. Uh, we gotta solve, we gotta solve. Um, this is panel number 12. So we're almost there. So panel number 13. Now what we wanna do is we just take partial derivative so if we assume our direction D is, uh, is like D1, D2, dot, 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 Dn transpose. So we have N component and uh, we need the partial derivative with respect to the ith component for every i is zero. And we take derivative of the ith component. Let's look at the dot product. The dot product is exactly the sum of Pi times Di. And this is lambda times summation of di squared subtract one. So now we take derivative of the first term, we'll get, uh, this is pi. So we take deri partial derivative with respect to di, we'll get pi. And we take partial derivative in the second term. This is a constant, so it's gone. And uh, uh, we'll get a two lambda di, and this is zero, okay. For every i. And then we take derivative of lambda, we set it to be zero, essentially we'll get the constraint. Okay, so we'll, we'll skip that. This implies what? This, Im this implies every component. Keep in mind, this lambda is a fixed number, okay? It's just one lambda. 
So this implies, this implies P vector plus two lambda. Uh, D vector is zero. And this implies the D vector, the D vector is uh, minus one over two lambda times P. This means the D vector is either in the same direction with P. Okay, let me write down, let me use this panel. So this implies So this equation implies D is either, so if this is P, then D is either in the same direction with P or it's uh, in the opposite direction with P. And P is what? P is the gradient at this point. Okay. Now it's kind of clear. So if we choose in the same direction with P, the function we want to maximize right there. Okay. On top of the panel number 12, on top of the panel num number 12, the function we want to maximize is positive when we choose this D in the same direction with the gradient and is the most negative when we choose D in the opposite direction of the gradient. So, and actually we've done our proof, okay. So if we choose D in the same direction with the gradient, we get the fastest directional derivative and that's why it increases fastest at this point. And a simple corollary is uh, a function decreases fastest when we choose the opposite direction of the gradient. Okay. So then, this is called actually the steepest descent. is we know that the gradient of f is the direction this function increases faster than the negative gradient of f is this function decreases fastest. So then we can introduce the fixed point iteration to get a local minimum if there exists one. This is actually corresponds to relaxation. So we recall in the first week of our class, we learned the relaxation to solve for f of x is zero. We just do x k plus one equals x k subtract lambda f of x of xk. So relaxation is solving for f of x is zero. We can think the stiffest descent is solving f prime is zero. Okay, we just change this to f prime. But this is a general, this is the general formula like for arbitrary dimension. We just follow, we just follow the direction of the negative gradient. So that's it for today. And on, uh, in Friday, um, so on Friday, we'll learn how to code this, like uh, um, for our homework. And on Monday, then we'll learn how to choose this lambda. Okay. So
So on Friday, we'll learn the effect of the lambda, like how do uh, this lambda affect um, this steepest descent. So that's it for today and uh, Friday. So we'll do our Euro coding lecture.